Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā tātou katoa. No mai, hari mai. Hello, everybody, and welcome to EHF's Impact Springboard. It's lovely to see you all on here. So we are focusing this time on leading innovation for global impact. And in this session, we are looking at going global, transforming New Zealand startups into global leaders. My name is Michelle Parker, and I am the Head of Fellowship Experience at the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. And we will open together here with a karakia. Po hihiri, po rarama, po o te whakaro, po o te tangata, po o te aroha, te po e hiri nei, ia tato, mauri ora ki a tato, haumie, huie, taiki e. So it's really nice to see you all here. EHF's Impact Springboard is running over four days. We started yesterday and it is all about connecting Aotearoa in New Zealand with our EHF fellows, our Hillary laureates and more key leaders around critical challenges and opportunities for Aotearoa New Zealand. In this session, we have a lovely panel with us and each panelist will have a few minutes to be able to share their stories and their insights and then we will open up for Q&A from there. Well, let us hand over now to Rosalie, who is going to be moderating um, our panel conversation today. So Rosalie being our CEO of uh, Hillary Institute and of um, the Edmund Hillary Fellowship. So kia ora, Rosalie. Uh, kia ora, e ngā mana, e ngā reo, e ngā rangatūrama, ki te mana whenua, tēnā koto. Ko maunga tapu, te maunga, e rūnei tāku ngāko, ngā tai te awa, Mahaya nei aku maharahara no pakatu aho. Ko Rosalie Nelson toki ingoa. Maori ora. Um, look, this is a session that I feel incredibly privileged to have the opportunity to facilitate. It's a very important session about how we can come together to help Kiwi founders to commercialize and go global. The 2003 uh, Global Startup Genome Report shows that New Zealand's startup ecosystem has been making huge strides in the last five years. It's grown about 46%. There's been increasing startup density. It's estimated there's about 2,500 startups and also access to early stage funding, which is almost double. However, we're still defined as an emerging ecosystem. While we have increasing exits worth over 50 million, and there are a few unicorns um, with valuations of over uh, um, uh, a billion, we are not still creating $100 million companies at scale. Our startup density, while it's grown, is still only half that of global peers. And our startups are working often with materially less money and taking longer to raise capital from offshore peers. And one of the, a critical challenge is how we can help the founders to go global. With a very limited domestic market, founders need to understand early in their life cycle uh, the scale of their ambition, how they how to sharpen their value proposition, to differentiate against competitors, and also to raise cap capital, often in what's a very different market and culture, and also to be able to do so in a way that still reflects their core New Zealand identity. So how do we address this commercialization and scale gap. And that's really what we wanted to kick off today with this discussion. So I feel very privileged to be joined by three innovation leaders today. Um, what I'm going to do is begin by introducing each of them and giving them that moment to be able to uh, speak and bring their perspectives. We would encourage you while you're listening to put any questions that you might have into chat. Um, once we've completed that, then we'll have the opportunity to go into the Q&A. So um, I'd like to kick off by introducing Marion Johnson. So Marion is the Chief Executive of the Ministry of Awesome, which is an organisation that seeks to transform the New Zealand economy through startup innovation. Uh, as CE, she led the establishment of Te Ohaka, which is the Ministry of Awesome's Christchurch-based headquarters and national startup hub. The founder, a uh, Catalyst Startup Incubation Program, she leads Electrify Aotearoa, and Electrify Accelerate, which is New Zealand's only women founders conference and venture accelerator. 
She's a trustee of New Zealand High Tech Trust, who are the organizers of the New Zealand High Tech Awards. And she was also, and I think this is critical, she was a key member of the New Zealand Startup Council, which was a, a, a government entity that was created to bring people together uh, and produced an upstart nation report about how we could move forward and better amplify and accelerate our innovation ecosystem. So Marion, we'd love to get your thoughts on the challenges and opportunities in this space. Just to note you're on mute, I'm so sorry. <laughs> note to self. Um, tēnā kōta katoa, ko Marion Johnson tōku inua. Um, thank you so much for that introduction, Rosalie, um, and thanks for having me um, along for this session today. It's amazing to see so many faces from all over the world. It's actually quite inspiring. Um, so as Rosalie said, I'm the Chief Executive at Ministry of Awesome, and um, I'll start off by giving you a little bit of context because you may not be familiar with the organization. Um, but Ministry of Awesome was created in 2012, um, right after the Christchurch earthquake. Um, and we were, I think the best way to put it is we were created as a think tank um, to look at how the city was going to um, develop itself and reimagine itself post earthquake. You may remember that the whole city was um, really decimated. There was no city center anymore. I was there throughout. Um, Erica Austin, who's on this call, was at Ministry of Awesome at that time um, and, uh, and was a, a major player in, in the work that Ministry of Awesome did. Um, I joined in 2017, so after the whole earthquake experience, um, things had really kind of crystallized as far as the economic development strategy for the city was concerned. And what became really clear was that because the city had reimagined itself, as every city in the world does at the moment, as a city of innovation, um, unlike other cities, they actually created a real strategy that backed um, that uh, achievement of that goal. And one of the key things that we had to do is we had to create a dynamic startup ecosystem that would power this future innovation. So the city itself was looking at some very specific economic clusters where we already had a real point of difference, aerospace, future transport, med tech, health tech, future food and fiber. And then underpinning all of that was uh, high tech. Um, but at that time, um, we did not have a dynamic startup ecosystem because if you wanted to um, have a high growth startup, if you wanted to establish one and you wanted to get support and you wanted to be with your peers, you really had to go to Wellington, Auckland, um, better yet, Sydney, Melbourne, Singapore, New York, somewhere outside, certainly not Christchurch. So while there were pockets of innovation and while there were pockets of startups, there was nothing connected and there was nothing that was actually beginning to bubble. So the first thing that we set up, um, set out to do was to um, change that for the city. So Ministry of Awesome was very specific to Christchurch in those very early days. And we followed a strategy which was threefold. The first one was making startups a thing. Um, so telling the story of startup, attracting people into the community, and then building capability um, for any talent that leaned in. Um, through accelerator programs, incubator programs, um, capability building sessions with mentors and so on. And then the third piece was about building community. So the program itself and Ministry of Awesome and the work that we did over the next sort of four years became really successful. We got um, an enormous amount of traction. And in uh, 2022, Christchurch actually became the fastest growing startup city in the world. And it is that that I think propelled, um, well, that I began a conversation with a, with a bunch of other people at MB, um, including Suze Reynolds and Phil McCaw and some other uh, people who are focusing on startup and how to grow our startup ecosystem in New Zealand. Um, and the Startup Council was born. And I think the context of the history of how we, the, the journey that we that took place in Christchurch from, you know, some small green shoots and then suddenly something that was absolutely humming and firing away is a really important lesson that we could bring to the country as a whole. 
Um, and so that was really my contribution to the Upstart Nation report um, was all about that early stage, how to build that community, how to seed um, a dynamic startup ecosystem. And I was joined on the Upstart Council with, um, I think it was five other individuals. Um, so that was Phil McCaw uh, from Movax, Suze Reynolds, obviously of the Angel Association, um, Grant Straker, who's a founder of Straker Translations, Mike Carden, a multi um, uh, founder of multiple startups um, that have gone global, Imshe Vega, who at the time was the CEO of Outset Ventures, which was more of a deep tech organization, and Carl Jones, um, who was the chief executive, is the chief executive of WNT Ventures. So most of the people who joined me around the table at the Startup Council were investors um, the, and, of course, the two founders. Um, essentially, the the Upstart Nation report was a report for government so that government could understand that from the work that we did and the research that we did within the founder community and across the startup ecosystem, from the deep dives we did at each individual ministry um, that formed part of government, what were the settings that needed to change? What was the work that needed to be done in order to really accelerate our um, growth as a startup um, nation? And it really boiled down to um, some, some major um, recommendations when it comes to, first of all, what happens generally with government and with government-sponsored startup activity is it only goes as long as the government is in place. And so you end up with a three year or four year cycle where policy is created and then it's discarded. Um, maybe the same party comes in again and so you get six years or eight years. Um, but in any case, creating a startup ecosystem and making a really successful startup ecosystem is, is a very long process. It doesn't take place in three or four years. So one of the key recommendations that we made was that we create a national body called Accelerate Aotearoa, it could be called absolutely anything, but the purpose of that national body was to reduce that fragmentation and coordinate the implementation of the strategy. So we were not envisioning another ministry or anything too unwieldy. We're talking about a small group that would essentially hold the reins, um, be separate from government, not staffed by government, but staffed by people who are startup operators, who are founders, who are investors, who are involved in the startup ecosystem and could hold the reins and guide through a whole series of um, activities that would um, propagate this uh, dynamic startup ecosystem. And it was actually critical that it not be a government group. Um, the, the other part of the recommendation is, is that there is a great deal of inefficiency around government, around startup and innovation in New Zealand, um, because there are so many pieces of activity that are held by disparate portfolios where one hand doesn't know what the other hand is doing and so on and so on. So by creating Accelerate Aotearoa, there was an opportunity to create total efficiency um, in the space, work to goals and objectives. And the model we sort of used there was LaunchVic. So Melbourne has been incredibly successful in building their startup ecosystem and Accelerate Aotearoa was meant to be a sort of quasi uh, launch VIC. The second um, recommendation was around pipeline. So we have a great talent pipeline in New Zealand, um, but as far as uh, founders are concerned, it's it's still not particularly full of highly capable people. So we need to tell the story of startup. We need to create a culture of startup ambition. Um, and we need to make startups a thing. So this is all about storytelling. This is all about role modeling. This is all about elevating the story of startup and the opportunity of startup for the entire country. Um, and then the third recommendation was around um, capability building. So yes, it's about building specific skills for founders at the early stage, but it's also around scale up because we don't have a lot of exited startup founders, um, we don't have a lot of experienced start startup operators. So how do we get more experienced start startup operators to help current startups scale? And then finally, most well, not most importantly, but as important as everything else, we need to revisit our capital um, 
ecosystem. So in order to hit 5,000 startups, which is where we need to be in order to be firing it around the same, the level that we want to, in order to transform the New Zealand economy, we'd need an additional approximately $2 billion um, dollars of investment capital. And so what that means is we would really need to update our tax settings, uh, which are currently fit for purpose for a simplified economy um, and woefully inadequate for a knowledge economy that the knowledge economy that we're trying to build. So it's offering incentives for people to invest into the startup ecosystem, um, removing barriers for things like KiwiSaver, et cetera. So um, the capital piece needs to grow alongside the talent piece, al alongside the founder piece in order for um, both to keep up with each other and continue to um, hit their stride. So those were the key themes that the Upstart Council, um, sorry, the Startup Council created in the Upstart Nation report, um, which is available online. And I would really encourage you to have a read of it. Um, an open discussion around it would be fantastic. Of course, we've changed governments now. Um, the Upstart Nation report landed approximately two weeks before the election cycle began. So um, we are now pressing hard to try to get that reviewed by the new government. Um, it's encouraging so far, but we have not yet had um, traction. So that summarizes um, my point of view. Marion, thank you so much. And that gives so much insight into what we need to do to really uh, to seed and accelerate the New Zealand innovation ecosystem. What I'd like to do is now pass the baton to um, Guy Tikinewe Royal. Um, because what Guy can bring is also that globalization perspective and where are some of the missing gaps and how we help the founders to go global. So Guy is an experienced commercial and investment advisor. He has over 30 years experience um, in management and governance roles in energy, investment, transport, agri-tech, and also particularly the indigenous development sectors. Um, he's been CEO for a professional advisory firm tribal authority and waste technology businesses. He's a former director of Kiwi Whale, New Zealand Growth Capital Partners, which is a fund of funds here in New Zealand, and the New Zealand Fast Forward Fund. He's currently a director of CH4 Global, which he helped to found, and that's a US clean tech methane inhibitor business with operations in the US, Australia, New Zealand, and Singapore. And in addition to all of this, he is the chair of the commercial arm of his tribe, uh, Rokawa Asset Holding Company. Um, so, Guy, we'd really love to get your perspectives on this challenge, particularly given your global investment um, background. Kia ora, Rosalie. I don't know if I uh, hoki no tawahi. Nā mi kia koutou katoa. Kia ora, everyone. Um, thank you. That was a very glowing uh, introduction. Thank you, Rosalie. Someone run a timer on me. I can go forever on this stuff. So five <laughs> minutes I've got. Um, and I'm just okay. trying to think, I'm looking at the audience, there's some familiar faces in this audience. Um, what would be really useful? I think there's a number of people from offshore. Um, I think just putting some context around New Zealand uh, might be really helpful. So first of all, the last uh, Polynesian island to be uh, populated. We are the largest Polynesian island. We're at the bottom of the Pacific. Um, and we have always felt keenly in our culture the isolation of being at the at the bottom of the Pacific. And and I have to say that I think the reality of that is still flows through today, even to driving a technology knowledge based industry, um, where I've seen first firsthand in the in the states um, the difference between having a few corporates to go in, in New Zealand to go and talk to and test your product and come back and reiterate and rethink versus having thousands and thousands of corporate customers around you to go and visit who are a drive or, you know, they're a day or two drive or go across the country if you're in the States and hit the other coast and then turn around and drive back another three days. But you can do it. In New Zealand, it's, a, it's to hit customer demand is really, really tricky, particularly if you want to be a globally focused business. The other higher level context, um, in 2022, there was a review done of all of the countries in the world, generally, uh, particularly the, the UN countries, who uh, around their export receipts, right? So how much money do you get into your country from, a, from someone else's pocket offshore? And in New Zealand, it was about 47, it's probably a bit more than that, it's about 70 billion in, in this country. And if you have a look at some equivalents of who we are, 
Uh, so we're about a, we're a 5.2, 5.5 million population. If you have a look at Denmark, they're about 6 million. They're 131 billion. So they are getting double what we get. Ireland, they're 100, almost 200 billion. Uh, and they're a population of about five and a half as well. Singapore, 5.5 million people. Export receipts is five and 500, I've got it written down here, $515 billion. So they are an order of factor of multitudes about what we receive as an income from our businesses. Everyone here, and most of you people who are offshore at the moment probably know New Zealand's a very primary sector focused uh, economy. Um, and we fundamentally sell protein. Now, having said that, our second largest uh, export earner is technology and it's growing dramatically. Uh, and and I think everyone kind of seen that where the global signals are that we have, um, we got that sector's probably going to grow and probably cross over our primary sector at some point in the next few years, five to ten years. The 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 imperative for growing startups in New Zealand is fundamentally in New Zealand we have just had our elections. Uh, a lot of the debate is around how we're going to pay for our infrastructure, who's paying for the teachers and the education and the schools and who's paying for the hospital and the health sector. If you are receiving that level of tax take from export receipts coming into New Zealand companies, a lot of that debate gets reduced or is in the least intense. Of course, everybody knows you just spend it on more and more things, but the reality is there's a savior to the New Zealand economy and that's about growing startups and growing to become global economies because this reduces a whole lot of social tension and a whole lot of other silly things that go on inside a country when you're sitting with a really reduced tax take and then people having to make really really kind of short-term uh, thinking, which is what Marion mentioned. And I'm just thinking, Marion, you made this comment around, we, they have a really short program thinking around how we build ecosystems here. It's very much like the infrastructure conversations. It's a three-year program. The things that need 20, 30 years thinking. And then we go from one government to another government to another. Now, to be frank, this is not just New Zealand issue. This is an issue for countries around the world. Everyone has this. But it's particularly acute in a small country like ours, where we're struggling to move from a, a previous primary sector driven economy, which did well for us in the 50s and 40s and 50s in wartime, when everybody needs meat and milk and clothing and wool and stuff like that into a modern the last 50, 60 years, we've struggled. So I think that's kind of the high level uh, comments I wanted to talk about that. Uh, I, I particularly focus in the indigenous sector. Uh, the Maori economy is like an economy inside an economy. It's, it's an emerging economy inside it. It looks very much like other indigenous economies, very tribally driven, land-based as the key assets. Uh, if you think the New Zealand sector is, is a primary sector focused uh, economy, the Māori sector is that on steroids. We are nothing but forests, fish, and farms. And a few others. And there's a couple of people here, uh, there's a couple of Māori guys, I see you, real, who are doing technology, they're working hard, but the reality is they're outliers. People like real on this line and, and others, they're, they're outliers. We don't have a strong technology focus proposition. Now, that was looked at and has been thought about for a little while now, and there's been a couple of programs who are examples of what we're trying to do to build the startup economy or thinking. Um, in various regions, I know there'll be a few here who might be said that in the various regions, a number of programs have been implemented for young people, rangatahi is the Māori name for that, who are about training them, moving them into STEM, moving them into, into technology. And there's a focused area around that. The advantage the Māori economy has is we have a large number of institutions whose sole focus is to grow their community. That's their job. They are the tribal entities. They have no, no other job but to grow their community. And in that way, you can pull some levers very quickly to kind of get people um, uh, aligned, putting money in and driving certain programs. The trouble is that's all teaching to ourselves. The, the obvious step is how do we build a global connectivity and, and reach? EHF was was as part of that. Kia community is part of that for New Zealand. Uh, um, I can claim a little bit. I'm an OG of EHF. I was there at the very first design program with the Monaghan brothers and Yosef Ayele. We were out in Whiteman's Valley and 
they told us they had this crazy idea of bringing a whole lot of inter people internationally if we can bring them into New Zealand. And so on whiteboards, we drew up what it might look like and that type of stuff. So I've, I've, with, I've got a lot of affinity and, and, uh, and love for the EHF program. Um, in the Māori sector, we instituted a program. When I say we, me, it feels like I claimed it. I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, but there was an idea to bring a whole lot of Māori business leaders and take them into the state and start exposing them. And they jumped on side along a, 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 the boot camp program that was being implemented under Peter Chris for the MB. Uh, it's called Tohono, H-O-N-O, -O, which means the joining. And, it would, and the idea was simply to take leaders out of New Zealand, business leaders, place them offshore, Yes, they can learn about innovation and new ways of thinking and, and, and you know, and product design and human-centered design models, and they can learn all that kind of stuff. Reality was, it was just getting them all in a room together and talking about how do we do this more collectively and, and more quickly. The Māori, there was a Māori group that went along with that, and they've, they've maintained that connection really well. In fact, they all met again. This is 20-something, 15 years post that session. They all met again uh, just last week, I think. Uh, there is a, a new program, uh, Finisterre uh, Ventures, which is a VC in the base in the States, uh, mainly Agritech. Uh, one of the founders is a New Zealander. Uh, his name's Arama Kukutai. Um, he, um, they've decided to build a program. They have a portfolio of Agritech companies in the States, Israel, Europe, and other places. They put a program called Te Araputiki, where a select number of young Māori who we think are capable would be placed into some high growth companies in that portfolio. And the idea is they would go over there, spend six months, a year, whatever the period is, come back and then really go. Um, I've got a million other things to talk about and we can get into it, but if you ask questions, we can, we can do it. So kia ora tate. Thank you, Guy. And look, I'm very reluctant to cut short because there is so much interesting that, that is, is in what you're saying. Um, look, I feel very privileged to now introduce um, Guy, uh, sorry, Anthony Lee. Um, so Anthony is a talent based in San Francisco and Birmingham. Uh, he's the managing director of Altos Ventures, which is a venture capital partnership with a long-term approach to building technology companies worldwide. Um, he is looking and is, as I understand, investing in, in businesses here in Aotearoa, New Zealand. He does serve on several private company boards um, as the lead independent director for Roblox Corporation. Um, but I think one of the really key things here is that he... Uh, is the long-serving board member and chair emeritus of TechSoup Global, which is an international network that distributes technology and capital to hundreds and thousands of nonprofits. And he also founded the C100. And this was an association that was to promote Canadian entrepreneurship globally. And he was a, also a founding member of the Full Circle Fund. The reason that we were so keen to have Anthony join us is that many of the challenges that Canada was facing are very similar to those in New Zealand. So there is a playbook and a model for how Canada harnessed the diaspora of talent um, in other sort of global ecosystems and what the benefits were of that. So we'd love to open up the space to Anthony to share his insights and experience from what he's heard. Kira, Rosalie, thank you for that introduction. Um, that's a nice biography, but I think the reason I'm actually here is because I missed my Cohort 7 welcome experience last spring. And as a result, Paula and Michelle urged me to just come for a day and swipe your visa uh, so that you can get started with New Zealand and get to know. So I came last July to Auckland for two days, one night. Um, had a whole series of terrific meetings with companies, with people in the government, with venture capitalists, investors, angel investors, entrepreneurs. And uh, as a result of that, I've ended up investing personally in a number of New Zealand-based seed funds. Uh, my daughter is going to attend Canterbury next fall for a semester. Uh, I will be back again uh, a couple of times a year, I'm going, I've just joined the board of a New Zealand company uh, and my firm uh, is participating in a, a Series A investment that will be announced tomorrow. It'll be one of the largest Series A financings for a New Zealand based uh, software company ever, I believe. So uh, that will hopefully hit the news tomorrow and you heard it here first, but I won't say the name. Um, 
I think the reason I'm uh, you wanted me to participate in the session today was to share a little bit about my experience with Canada and with C100. So I am actually a Chinese Canadian living here in Silicon Valley. And, you know, Guy, you were talking about small countries that punch above their weight. And, uh, you know, Canada is much larger than New Zealand, but compared to the United States where I sit today, Canada is that small, modest small, uh, Commonwealth country uh, situated next to a big, annoying neighbor, just like you guys are. And uh, very similar in many ways to New Zealand. We're rooted in First Nations peoples, very much influenced recently by immigration, especially from Asia, uh, very well endowed with natural resources, but trying hard to move away from primary and extractive industries into more of a knowledge economy. And, you know, like Kiwis, Canucks travel really well. So there are several hundred of thousand of us here in the United States. And as we like to say, we're not the lazy 1% of Canadians, uh, but very highly motivated uh, financiers and technologists and entertainers who've come to the United States to work in those kind of industries. Uh, but all of us have very high affinity back to our home country. And that's where the story of C100 starts. So we were all sitting here in Silicon Valley uh, 12 years ago. And you know, we're used to being called brain drain, right? We had left our home country to go somewhere else. And uh, working here in, in Silicon Valley was, was certainly like the center of this brain drain. And a, a number of us went up to the 2010 Winter Olympics in Vancouver and saw that the country had put together this very ambitious program called Own the Podium, where the ambition was to win the most gold medals at the Winter Games. A very un-Canadian, immodest thing to try to shoot for, but they succeeded on the very last night the ice hockey team won in overtime and the, the country walked away with the most gold medals ever after having never won a single gold medal on home soil uh, in two tries. So we saw that this sort of small group of people in a modest country could have a big ambition and do something transformative. And we said, why don't we do that for technology? And at the time in 2010, the Canadian tech industry was really suffering. Um, Nortel was our Nortel Networks was our biggest company had gone bankrupt. Uh, research in Motion, which made the BlackBerry, was just starting to get assaulted by Apple and would soon crumble. So our two largest tech companies were under assault and the uh, the startup economy was in bad shape. Uh, venture capitalists had not really succeeded domestically and all of our friends back home were asking for help. So a number of us got together here in Silicon Valley and started a nonprofit association called the C100. If you want to look it up online, it's the C100.org. And our job was really to harness a number of successful entrepreneurs, operators, and investors here in Silicon Valley, all Canadian expats, to help Canadian companies back home get bigger faster. Uh, Marianne, you talked about ambition. And I believe in New Zealand, you have something called three Bs. Uh, in Canada, we had uh, you know, a lack of ambition in, in a sense that companies and entrepreneurs would sell out too soon and take those dollars and retire. We called it B2C and B2B, back to cottage and back to bicycling. And so we thought we could do better than this and uh, inspire entrepreneurs to think bigger, move faster, access capital, talent, networks, and build multi-billion dollar companies. And that sort of happened. So in the last dozen years or so, the Canadian ecosystem has gone from about a billion, less than a billion in, in annual venture capital to more than 15 billion at the peak in 2021. It's settled around uh, six or seven billion Canadian dollars today and produced a number of very large uh, public companies, Lightspeed, Point Click Care is a great private company, Shopify is one you probably know uh, that have come through C100 programs and grown up in Canada and become very uh, instrumental in world technology. So that's that's sort of the template that I wanted to share with you all as one smaller country doing something big and, and, and really tapping into the expertise here in Silicon Valley, the networks here in Silicon Valley uh, to, to turbocharge the economy back home. And the idea again is to really raise that ambition and exposure level to connect through the networks and to do it over a long period of time because we have to engage the government in this. We have to engage private sector. Uh, we've We've influenced government policy, both on tax and on immigration. So we have a number of programs in Canada that make it very easy for institutions like mine to invest in Canada, uh, make it very easy for immigrants to go work in Canada, take advantage of the fact that it's actually quite difficult for entrepreneurs and immigrants to come work in the United States. 
in some ways, Donald Trump was the best thing that ever happened to the Canadian ecosystem. So, you know, we're we're just trying to be very nimble, very quick, but do it, do it over a long period, period of time. So it's really a decades long commitment that the government and the private sector have to make together. Anthony, thank you so much. You're describing something that's effectively multi-year, multi-generational. What's the critical starting point? You, you talked about culture and ambition. Is that the starting point that we need to be looking at here? Yes, and organizationally for us, it was really uh, finding role models, right? Uh, it, it's really important. One of the things that makes Silicon Valley so unique is that there's this mythology of founders and and uh, we really celebrate these crazy outlier founders. And that's not really done in the Canadian culture. I don't think it's really done in the Kiwi culture as much. Uh, you know, we, we have a little bit more of a modest Commonwealth approach to things. So one of the things to do is we can be nice, but really embrace those big ambitious role models. And then tactically, when we started the C100 organization, we did it in cooperation with government, but we said, look, this has to be private sector run. It has to be small. We've got to move fast. We need your support, but you cannot run it. And that was the, the agreement we had back in 2010 when we started. And that's what allowed us to, to get it off the ground. Can I go back to this issue of ambition? Because I know that it's been raised a number of times. Guy, are our founders ambitious enough in terms of what they can do? Is that a starting point? Yeah, I, I, I'm I quite happy to put my stand in the ground. And I think that's it's across both all of New Zealand culture. It's also now Maori Pacific Polynesian Island cultures as well. I think it's a it's a function of a number of factors. Um, and it really is, just thinking about that Canadian experience, you really do do need a couple of people just to front it, right, and to give everybody. So we've had a couple of people here, Rod, Jerry, and Aaron. There's a few in the Maori space who are doing the tech, technology, but we really do need people to be, to, people can, can aspire to be something that they can see themselves. Um, I have to say, be amazing to measure the impact that someone like Taika Waititi will have um, and to move into the creative industries. I, I think you'll have an, 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 a complete um, disproportionate impact. So I, I don't think we're ambitious when you go to some of the, the startup and, 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 and um, incubator programs. You, I have to say, I feel a little bit, it's concerning that there's not enough desire to grow a business and get offshore and grow it. And, and contribute to the New Zealand economy that way. Uh, I, I don't know where, it, maybe it's this Commonwealth, maybe we've even here in this, this Anglo-Saxon, get your head down, I, I'm not quite sure. I'm, I don't know if it comes from a Polynesian thing. I don't know where it comes from. Marianne, you spoke about the fragmentation and the disconnection uh, that exists both within the ecosystem. How do we better connect uh, founders into global ecosystems and to those that can bring both market access skills as well as resources? Um, I mean, there are a lot of different agencies that are working on that piece right now, the most successful of which is probably NZTE, um, who do a lot of great work in terms of connecting um, local startup founders with international, um, the international sector, and we'll take them on things like country tours and so on. And that has a, that has a really um, strong impact. Um, but I think there's also, there's also so many organizations that are working in and around the startup space um, who are duplicating um, their work. There are so many different kind of versions of local startup hubs um, and, and each of them is looking for funding, uh, mostly from government. Um, there's a complete absence of uh, corporate New Zealand mm -hmm. in the startup ecosystem. Um, everybody sort of looks to government to support all of this um, without having a real uh, you know, strategy in place um, and without under, and, and without having you know very specific swim lanes, so that each organization needs understands exactly what their contribution needs to be and what success looks like. 
So from, from my perspective, it really has to do with, you know, things really started to fire on all cylinders in Christchurch and Canterbury when the swim lanes were created, when a strategy was created, when there was a goal in place that we had to hit, when there were numbers and metrics to go back and measure by. Um, and, and that's exactly what we need on a national level. Um, so yes, a lot of that is about defragmenting um, the ecosystem, but I think first and foremost, it's about creating a strategy and then working out exactly what um, types of organizations there need to be in order to implement that strategy. And I believe that that has to be, as Anthony's experience with C100, it has to be separate from government but it has to have support from government. Can I ask what the nature of that support needs to be? We, we tend to default to look to government for funding. And given the gap of corporates that you've identified, often we put a lot of weighting on expectations from, from government. But what is the real role that we should be asking for government, particularly for helping this portion of commercialization and going global? And I, I open that up to everybody, but I would be keen to get Anthony's thoughts because of the way that you built the C100. Well, in Canada, and I'm sure it's not dissimilar in New Zealand, Canadians tend to ask, why isn't government doing this? And in the United States, people ask, why is the government doing this? Um, so we, you know, we think it's important to have the support. Government capital can help, but ultimately it's private capital that makes the, the biggest difference. And what we were able to do with C100 was really open the eyes of Silicon Valley to the possibility and the fact that there were great companies being built in Canada. And greed takes over very quickly. People figure it out and they find opportunities. And I think that is starting to happen with what I can see in New Zealand. It feels like the ecosystem is at an inflection point. There are companies and, and founders coming out that have the sophistication and ambition to build something just as good as what we see here in Silicon Valley. And in fact, this company we're backing in New Zealand, we're backing not because they're in New Zealand, but because they're as good as anything we can find here. Uh, so I think it's a really great moment where we just have to, you know, as a, as a community here, keep bringing those people back and forth. So get them on the planes, get them out there, open their eyes and they'll find it, they'll figure it out. Rosalie, can I have a shot? Uh... I'll just try and get some controversy into this. Um, and uh, and so my glib comments around where it culturally, I have no idea. So whoever it is, I don't know why we had lack of ambition. Sometimes it's because you're just so busy trying to keep your, pay the bills and keep keep the kids fed that maybe it's too tricky to go off and build global business, businesses. I have a shot at uh, ambition around our government. Um, uh, I think NZT is doing a great job, but I have to be careful because my my mate Dylan Lawrence heads the investment team there and, and Peter Crispy they're doing a great job. But observing uh, our government agencies, we're a small country and I just don't think you can do it without a, some sort of centralised support model. It's just when you're a small economy, the government is always going to be a really useful lever. But watching sometimes government officials involved in transaction activity offshore, when they go off and introduce and say they get a, there's a contract with DARPA and there's a negotiation or something that a New Zealand founder's got, and they're walked to this to the to the meeting by a New Zealand official, and and then when you hear them say, "Oh, it sounds like you guys are talking commercial arrangements now," I've I better step away from all of this because New Zealand has a very you know and. I can understandably a very purist approach to this, but when you compare it to how watching um, Singaporean or Israeli officials, their equivalents, deal with trying to get their businesses, their founders over the line, there's quite a stark difference. And I wonder sometimes we're a bit reticent and really reaching out and doing the best we can for New Zealand businesses. You're on mute, Rosalie. Apologies, this was my fault. I hadn't unmuted mm -hmm. myself. Um, we have got a comment here from, uh, actually from Claire Gallagher and also from Helen. And Claire, I'm just wondering if you could share that and you know, perhaps frame it as, as a question, which is around the way that your aspirations have often been framed within New Zealand. Sure, <laughs> thank you. Um, 
our business has working with some like very big tier companies as our clients and we recently launched in August and our trajectory has kind of been like this and we've been really well supported by uh, MOA and by some other private um, impact accelerator funds but we are basically feel like we're doing it alone and we are currently undertaking um, venture capital investment and like on that journey and Every single advisor we talk to, like, they're right. They're like, is this the right decision for you? Is this the right stage? This is the pros, these are the cons. But we're like, we want world domination. We want to achieve these things. We've got this five-year goal. And they're like, you know, maybe you could just take it easy. <clears throat> you know, don't, don't go after this big goal. That's okay. And it makes me feel like, am I wrong for having these big goals? And can I not achieve them uh, as my support network? Not doubting me, but there's such a small percentage of people who actually do achieve those, you know. <laughs> Claire, thank you. And I think it just goes to the heart of some of the conversation. Is there any comments from, from the panel just to what Claire's outlined? I think that there's, there's, there's definitely plenty of ambition from the founders in um, that we come across at Ministry of Awesome. And, you know, we're, we're constantly going through um, some sort of a selection for either our incubator, which runs year round, um, or at the moment, uh, we've just closed off Electrify Accelerator, which is the Women Founders Accelerator. And there is no shortage of ambition um, for those founders. The, the thing is, I believe that what, what we're missing is a national uh, understanding of what startup represents. And that's why we have, we, we have a much quieter pipeline than we, than we hope to have. Um, so we don't have enough people thinking, I have a great idea. I'm going to take this worldwide. I'm going to change the world. I'm going to absolutely, you know, go to the moon with this idea. We don't have enough people coming in. It's not that there's no one. We just don't have enough. And I think the reason, the, the, the moment that you have one, two, three really successful startup founders telling their story and being role models for others, others know that they can do it. We've seen it happen again and again and again. And the strategy um, has, look, I, I'm, I'm going to point at Christchurch again. In the very beginning, we had, gosh, five people in, in Te Ohaka. We had five founders in the space. And now um, we are wall to wall and we're dealing with 40 founders um, every single year. Um, 60 if you count all of the founders that are coming on board online and not counting all of the people in the accelerators. So telling the story attracts others. Um, when others hear that it is possible that you can do it from New Zealand, that you don't have to be a graduate from Stanford, that you don't have to you know, have uh, access to high net worth individuals that you can actually follow this through, um, then more people will follow. I think that's a critical element of um, what's gonna lead us towards success. Thank you. I want to pick up on something that um, one of our fellows, Lena, has raised around Singapore, and this is New Zealand's point of differentiation. One of the things that we often hear is this concept of Aotearoa New Zealand being a base camp for global impact, a, a testbed for what could be done globally. And that often we bring a different mindset, a different approach, and a different set of values. That we don't want to replicate Silicon Valley, we can do something that is unique here. We like to say that to ourselves. Is there truth to it? Or is that just making ourselves feel better? And I'm opening that to all the panel. It's a great, I don't know. <laughs> it's a great, it, could be a, it could be a complete uh, falsity that we're telling ourselves. The reality is, it doesn't matter. Um, the aspirations that have a better life, it's built inside every DNA of every human being. And we just, I think, um, I, I think there's, you got to believe in, in the uniqueness that you bring. And the and the belief in itself engenders and creates. And so, uh, I think there is generally contribution from New Zealand. I think there is a generally ability to 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 go into this into the market. We've been talking about it for a number of years in New Zealand. Um, 
we I don't we're just not quite hitting our straps for various reasons. There is a big issue. I mean, Claire, my point to you, Claire, is if you if you've got advisors saying you just sit back and but you need to go get some <laughs> happy to chat. We'll get you some other people to help you grow. There's plenty of people out there help you. One of the issues we do have in New Zealand is a gap, really. In, um, and Anthony will know this. It's, it's a it's a common statement in the VC world is you don't invest in the product, you invest in the team. And it's the quality of the management team to drive a business and give the, all your investors and give everyone confidence that this idea that you have really can you can really go and off and execute on it. And the we don't have in New Zealand economy a truckload of middle management kind skill sets of people who've moved from one business and some corporate, made their way up, then they've jumped across to another industry, another sector, learned that sector, then moved across and then moved their ways up into the C-suites and that type of stuff. We don't have a huge pool of those people because those are the sort of people that Claire could go rely on go, right, this is my plan. This is what I want to do. I want to achieve. I just need, you've got experience in this. Can you go and build me the financial model that drives all of this stuff, you know, properly hedging and all that kind of stuff. And through to, you know, product development, can you help me work on these? We just don't have track loads of pull of those kind of people around. And there's a trouble. It's a, the problem is it's a vicious circle. And if you don't have that, you go to business. If we had more businesses doing that, we'd have more of those. There's a kind of a gap in the New Zealand sector around that. Right. But Guy, I think you have the start of that, and EHF has done a great job injecting some of that DNA in into the New Zealand ecosystem. And uh, you know, in the early days of C100, we had a person on our staff whose job it was to talk to the companies, figure out what they needed, and connect them manually with people in the network. Uh, you know, it's probably hard for harder for EHF fellows or or entrepreneurs in the ecosystem to, to reach out directly sometimes um in the network and they might not be aware of the skill sets and the interests um but we had a we had essentially a traffic cop that was doing that for people it was very effective i think this is a really crucial point and this is this is something that's come up quite a lot recently in conversations um particularly around capability building and in the startup general report you'll note that auckland is actually a little bit further along than Wellington, Christchurch, and the rest of New Zealand, in the sense that there is a, a we're getting closer to the density that we need to get to in Auckland, um, and that the challenge for Auckland now is how to scale up. So it's not about the startup of the pipeline; it's not not having enough talent coming into the pipeline as it is in um, other cities still. In Auckland, it's more, okay, with the startups that are in the pipeline, how do they begin to scale and how can they scale successfully um, with as, as little you know, wastage as possible? And the first challenge that comes up, the first three challenges that come up when you're scaling up are essentially people, operations, finance. And it's these three areas where the founder, if, if we can build capability or we can add capability or guidance in those three kind of critical vulnerable areas at that particular stage, that will help us um, uh, scale up a whole lot more successfully. Um, and that could look like any number of things that could look like EHF um, network coming to play, that could be Kia, that could be both. Um, there's any number of ways that we could solve that problem. But those three key things are things that founders need to be freed up on so that they can focus on growing their business. Um, and those are major stumbling blocks. So that's that's my, my thinking around scale up. But I do really want to, if I could, I'd like to go back to something that Guy said in an earlier question that you had, Rosalie, around the positioning of New Zealand and what does New Zealand represent in terms of um, a, a fresh voice in the worldwide startup ecosystem. I, I firmly believe that's true. If you look at New Zealand and if you if you look at our nation and you look at the history of what we have brought um, to the world, the things that have made New Zealand incredibly unique, it is that we are an incredibly progressive nation. And we've shown that a number of times. So I'm not saying perfection has been achieved here, but the progressive nature that allowed the first um, right to vote for women, um, the way that we are trying to rectify and um, and build on the wisdom um, of our indigenous population, the way that we are trying to um, 
leave the world a better place, which seems to be a theme that is really quite resonant for New Zealanders, and, and they're not alone in that, but it is very resonant here in New Zealand, is, is, um, is something that if it's at the heart of the startup culture, that could have an incredibly positive impact on the world. And again and again, when we meet founders, all of those three themes keep coming out in terms of wanting to buck the trend that they don't want to build their companies like a Silicon Valley company, that they don't want to just be consistently increasing shareholder value and not providing value to their customers or providing negative impact to the world. Um, that is a position that I think New Zealand can own, that we can be proud of and that we can leverage for our success. Thank you so much, Marion. And that's such a beautiful point. Now, I'm very conscious that we're at 11. So many of us will have to um, jump off. However, I'm conscious that Lily's had her hand up for a while. So if anyone can just stay on for one last question, um, we'd love to be able to give the space for Lily, uh, who is joining us from Tolaga Bay and is doing amazing innovation work, particularly for Māori there. Morena Tafano. Thank you so much, Rosalie. Uh, ju just very briefly, um, so I am Lily. I'm representing our Tara Fiti region, that is the east coast of New Zealand. Um, the reason I became a fellow was to tap into the expertise of international brains, investors, um, networks. We have created our own tech strategy. Um, as we say, we do things slightly differently. We, we sort of roll together. So we connect our different tech companies that we have with, um, you know, pathways to um, technology employment for our rangatahi. So it, it's, it's like an ecosystem, if you call it. Is that what you guys call it? Um, anyway, we've been doing that for a while. We've got um, all sorts of initiatives in play. Where our frustration lies is no one listens to us or they don't come to our region because we're not an Auckland or a Wellington. So so my question to these wonderful guy, your wonderful experience, Anthony, your wonderful experience, Marion, in terms of our region, which is deep and beautiful indigenous um, empowerment and knowledge, uh, our expertise on the drivers on the ground, leading tech companies and pathways as well, how might we get our voices heard to get more support on our strategy that we've got in play? This is a conversation. Oh, sorry. Oops, sorry. You, go, you go, Mary. No, you go ahead, Guy. I just, I, I just had a clarifying question. Who do you want your voice heard to? Um, the likes of yourselves. <laughs> who who know how to help build these ecosystems um, with a team of leaders. You talk about founders and, and have an ambition. We have more than ambition. We have passion and a responsibility to make things better for, for our, our region. We have to go from forestry, farming, fishing to technology. So it's about how do we develop some of our technology companies that we, we already have in place? How do we find more um, agri-tech solutions to our, our environmental issues? How do we do, do better data collection for our oceans and water monitoring and the climate change that's occurring? So, so, so it's big. It, it's, it's just knowing the types of organisations that might want to walk with us i got a list i can see the tea. Lily, you. because that is such a big question um, what i'm thinking we might do is take that one up offline because we're really talking about building um uh tight yeah. and the whole regional economy so big 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 question but very happy to get the feedback from the team offline. Um, what I'd like to do now is just hand back to Michelle to do a, a closing karakia. But before I do that, this has been such a fascinating conversation. It's been so interesting to hear the diverse and different perspectives. 
Of course, there's no easy answers and there's no silver bullets, but we do hope this is the beginning of a conversation. There's some things that we would like to take forward out of this as part of the EHA. Um, so let's keep the dialogue going. Um, and I'll and very big thank you to Anthony Lee for joining us from the US, to Guy Royal and to Marion Johnson. You have been completely amazing and we feel very privileged to work with you in the ecosystem. Nami Have a great rest of your day. Yeah, thank you, Rosalie, Marion, Guy, and Anthony. Really, really nice to have your insights um, and to go all over global and Aotearoa New Zealand um, focus on that conversation. Um, challenges and opportunities, a lot of them covered in there. And of course, this is just really an opening of that conversation. And Lily, we will definitely um, jump on another call with you. Um, we will be here on your journey with you. Um, so a quick question to those of you on the call, uh, just to close out and have your voice again, is just what opportunities do you see for Aotearoa New Zealand startup ecosystem moving forward? So, you know, based on things that you've heard or even your experiences, where do you see the opportunity um, into the future? So put that in the chat. Um, I'll give you a minute to have a think uh, and to share that in there. And we'll also just share that um, this is one of many sessions that are happening this week uh, for the Impact Springboard. So if you're interested in these kind of conversations with um, global thought leaders and um, really thinking outside the box and stretching, expanding far together, then um, jump on to the link that will be put in the chat as well, um, which is has got the other sessions coming up for this week. All right, seeing a few things coming through there. Um, thank you, it looks good. Great, okay, we will um, capture those and have a think and look into the opportunities moving forward together. Now let's close out um, our time together with a karakia. Kia hora te marino, kia whakapapa ponamo te moana. Hei huarahi mā tato e te rangi nei, aroha atu, aroha mai, tato e a tato katoa. Kia ora everybody, nā mihi, thank you for being here. Thank you.